Good morning, or at least I'm taping this in the morning. We are going to start our lectures this morning with the materials and music. Our textbook talks about that there are six different ways that you can divide the field of music. And this morning we're going to talk about two of the three primary areas. The three primary areas are melody, harmony, and rhythm. Then the book goes on to talk about how you can talk about music in three other secondary areas and talk about the forms, the music's textures, and then, of course, forms and uh, tempo and dynamics, I mean. So we're going to start this morning first with the subject of melody. What do you think of when you remember your favorite song? Probably what comes to mind first is the tune, the overall idea, the musical uh, motive of it. Some of you are taking English 1100 and in that class you're learning about writing essays and one of the things that your instructor talks to you a lot about is the thesis statement. The melody of a composition is kind of like a thesis statement. It's what the composer probably would come up with first and then everything else would hinge around that. The textbook's definition of a melody is a succession of single pitches perceived by the mind as a whole. Years ago when I first started teaching this class I thought wow that's a little too much for a music appreciation setting. It's a little too scientific but the more that it's permeated through my brain I really think that it's a great definition. A succession of single pitches so that means that one note, one tone, is feeding into another. And so you're creating a horizontal line. And this horizontal line of music is going to be hovering over everything else that's going to be eventually added to the whole of the composition. So a succession of single pitches perceived by the mind as a whole or as a unit is a wonderful definition for the concept. But if you want to think about it in more layman's terms, think about it as the main idea, the main lyric of the piece. One of the terms in that definition is pitch. And of course you could talk about pitch in terms of it being a note or a single tone, but if you want a more scientific definition, pitch of course refers to the frequency. So if you are thinking about a high pitch versus a low pitch, the faster the rate of vibration of the sound waves, the higher the pitch. So if I had a flute player here this morning and I asked her to sing, play a, a really high note for us, then we would have very fast moving sound waves. If you remember back into your days in maybe a physics class or a physical science class in high school, you might remember the sound waves in a chart or in a book or in a slide that your teacher might have shown you and you would sometimes see sound waves that had big, uh, slow-moving troughs. And that might be a sound wave that's produced by a tuba player or a trombone player, something that naturally has a much lower um, register, a much a lower range to it than, say, a flute or a piccolo or, or an oboe might have. So the faster the rate of vibration, the higher the pitch. The slower the rate of vibration, the lower the pitch. That brings us to another uh, definition that's very important within the field of melody, the range. When you look at a piece of music, then you're trying to find the highest and the lowest note, especially if you're a wind instrument. If you are a pianist, if you're a violinist, then you really don't give a flip about the range. But if you are actually having to breathe into your instrument, I'm a vocalist. So when I sing, I'm very, very concerned about looking at what is the highest note and what is the lowest note that I'm going to have to sing in this particular piece of music. Because if the range doesn't fit with my own individual inherent range, then we've got a problem. I'm going to have to have it transposed. I'm going to have to have it moved up or moved down to suit my own individual range. So when you go to your concerts this semester, try to listen for soloists. If you go to a band concert where there's a trumpet player 
and they're having a little bit of a trouble reaching those higher notes, then the music might be a little bit too high, too taxing for that trumpet player's own individual range. It's just something to remember. The book also talks about how you can divide a piece of music into a couple of different categories. Now this is rather subjective, but they say that a narrow range is something that has maybe four or five notes. A medium range has eight notes at its heart, somewhere around that, and eight is a very significant number in music, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. A wide range is something that maybe has ten or more notes. So when you were growing up, maybe you attended church, and maybe you were in a little uh, cherub choir, or when you were in kindergarten, maybe you had a music teacher that would come in and teach you a little song. So you might remember singing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Something like that has very few notes to it. So it would be very accessible for a child of that age. And so it would be a narrow range. But if you think about our country's national music, then there's a wonderful song called My Country Tis of Thee. Sing with me for a moment. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. Now, as you were singing that, maybe you did or maybe you didn't, maybe you just think I'm a silly old professor, but if you were singing along with me, was that really difficult? Was it really taxing? My Country Tis of Thee has seven notes as its range, and so just one off from that number of eight. So we would consider that to be a medium range. But now let's think for a moment about our country's national anthem. How many times have you been to a football game or a baseball game and you've seen this poor soul go out to the pitcher's mound and they sing the country's national anthem a cappella? A cappella is a term that's used when you're creating music by singing alone. You don't have any instrumental accompaniment. So the singer gets out there and they start the piece a little too high or maybe a little too low. Our country's national anthem is a very difficult song to sing. When you look at its range, it has 12 notes. If you try to go for the big flashy high note at the end, then that makes it a 16 note uh, range. So you better be sure that you know your home base pitch, your starting point, when you try to sing that. Otherwise, you're going to be screeching at the end. So I've had uh, the um, misfortune of hearing the national anthem done very poorly at, at some of these sporting events. But of course, when it's sung well, when it's played well, it can be a very moving experience. And one of the reasons for that is because it has such a wide range. It has a much more exciting um, feel to it. So think about your favorite rendition of the national anthem. You might want to go and listen to it now. A couple other terms under the heading of melody are conjunct and disjunct. Now, if you were to write these two terms in a paper and you're typing it in your Word document, it, the Word document is going to underline disjunct. It's not a recognized term in the English language, but that's okay. It, um, it serves a purpose here for us today. My Country Tis of Thee, we just sang that. Um, the melody in that doesn't have a lot of movement. You're moving basically just up the scale or down the scale as you're going through that particular piece of music. So we would label my country to the as being primarily conjunct. Conjunct means that the notes in the melody lie in close proximity to one another. Again, let's go to our country's national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? Just in the first couple of phrases, you're jumping around a great deal. The national anthem would be considered to be primarily disjunct, where the notes are further apart. 
in a lot of the different motions. So you're skipping around. You're not just stepping up or stepping down or staying the same. You're leaping up and down a great deal throughout the whole of the melody. So it's considered more disjunct. These are just some ideas for you to keep in mind as you begin to identify the melody in some of the classical compositions that we're going to be discussing this semester and also some of the things that you're going to be hearing at the concerts that you're attending.